So, we do not, like, let's start probably. Let's do it on time. So, welcome. Welcome to the operational security capabilities for IP network infrastructure working group, also known as OPSEAC, much shorter. I'm Jen. My co-chair Ron is online, could not be with us physically, unfortunately. So a bit of housekeeping. Can I move the slide? Yes, the slide you've been seeing the whole week. This is not well. Please note it. I read it. And then particularly, please make sure we are nice to each other. On is it? A so it's funny, right? If you are not sure how to be nice to each other, please apply the rule of thumb. You only say something is two out of three, at least two out of three conditions are met. What you're saying is true, necessary, and kind. So, uh, thank you for volunteering to take minutes. We have minutes taken now. Housekeeping, uh, please scar QR code for blue sheets. For we normally now have a like legacy compatible blue sheet QR code somewhere, but not in this room apparently. Oh, here it is. So either use on site client on your phone or laptop or scan this QR code, please. So we know how many people we got, or other or next time we're gonna sit on the floor because the room will, will be too small. Uh if you uh, would like to ask questions, I would appreciate if you join the queue, I mean, meet echo queue, even if you are physically in the room, because it would be much easier for me to make sure, uh, much easier for me to do the queue management. I'm not transport person, I'm, I'm very bad at queue management. So please help me with uh, using uh, the meet echo. And please put your phone on silent. So we're not getting any soundtrack for presentations. Uh, presenters, if you're presenting remotely, please keep your audio and video off until you actually start talking. Okay, um, what else? Sir? Oh, what, what we've done actually since Yokohama? Well, we have two RFC, two drafts in RFC editor's queue. So my job is done. And since Yokohama, we have adopted a new working group document, which Fernando is going to present in a second about security implications of IPv6 addresses. So, yes, agenda. Uh, we have a very last minute lightning talk, basically, about revising BGP security best practices. But we'll start with Fernando's working group document about implications of IPv6 addresses. Then we'll talk about revisiting BGP security best practices. And it will be another talk about informational talk about on network path validation ideas. Any last minute additions, suggestions? Someone got a brilliant idea after talking to people in the lobby? Something which might be in scope for the working group? Jeff, I go into microphone. Oh, okay. Okay. The, let's start then. Okay, Fernanda, would you like me to control the slides so you're going to uh, control them yourself? Uh, yes, please. Can you do it? Yes, please. What? Uh, uh, okay. If you yes, can I'll, control I'll the slides. It. I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. Awesome. And just a second. Okay, Sli you should see the slides. Okay, hi all, uh, I am Fernando Gont. I will be uh, presenting our document, Implications of IPv6 Addressing on um, Security Operations. Um, it's a document that uh, since the last IETF meeting has been adopted as a uh, working group item. Uh, next slide. So um, 
you know, as a bit of uh, background about this document, essentially this, um, and next slide, yeah. Uh, this document essentially came up as a result of, uh, you know, having conversations with different kind of teams, like DevOps teams, um, you know, uh, cloud security practitioners and so on, uh, when it came to IPv6. So, um, you know, in my experience talking with these groups, a lot of the things that, you know, for, you know, for us, for some group of us that are involved, you know, at the ITF are kind of like obvious about IPv6, they are not exactly obvious to, you know, these other teams. Uh, in a lot of cases, you know, they approach IPv6 as, okay, well, it just has longer addresses, but essentially I can do, you know, the same thing or I can, you know, follow the, the same practices. The thing is that, you know, the, uh, you know, the differences that, uh, you know, we find in IPv6 when it comes to addressing ends up, you know, having, uh, you know, concrete, uh, you know, implications, at least when it comes to security. And, you know, the issue here is that, you know, as long as folks try to apply the same practices that they apply for IPv4, there's like, you know, a, a, a high probability of, of failure or, you know, um, unexpected consequences, if you wish. Uh, next slide. So, um, you know, when it comes to security operations at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the question or, you know, the, the, the important thing has to do with, you know, what's behind an IPv6 prefix. Uh, and, you know, when we say IPv6 prefix, we are, you know, talking about like, you know, anything that could be like a slash something to a whole, you know, slash 128, meaning like a single, um, you know, IPv6 addresses, a single IPv6 address. Now, um, you know, obviously we all know that in the case of IPv6, you know, we could have like uh, multiple addresses, whether, you know, within the same, you know, prefix or in different prefixes that could actually map to the same host. That's something that is different or usually different from, you know, what happens in the IPv4 world. And, but we also, uh, we can also find like all the cases where, you know, whether we like it or not, we have scenarios where we have um, a single IPv6 address or a group of IPv6 addresses that actually map to multiple nodes. There are examples of, you know, NatPT uh, being employed for IPv6. Uh, this is, you know, uh, I'm just the messenger here, you know, whether we like it or not, that's, you know, part of the, you know, deployed reality. And there are also cases such as, you know, the way Kubernetes uh, implements or uh, uses IPv6, where in a lot of cases, uh, you know, the way uh, IPv6 is employed is by using ULAs plus NAT. Um, you know, that's what we have. And, you know, essentially these are the things that, you know, uh, these groups like, you know, uh, you know, cloud security groups, uh, you know, DevOps groups and so on. These are the scenarios that uh, they have to deal with. So. You know, originally uh, we came up with this document uh, after having conversations with with these groups and uh, you know finding that they were, for example, uh, when they were employing like block lists, they were just you know blocking a single address, and we would you know go back to them and say, well, you know, for the usual case, you are not going to be able to do much by blocking a single address because you know the attacker will normally have control of a, of at least a slash sixty four, for example. There are also in cases in which they were, you know, meaning to uh, configure uh, a load list and they were just trying to, uh, uh, you know, specify the load list as a slash 128. But, you know, the nodes in question were, for example, using temporary addresses. And obviously, you know, uh, uh, that of uh, specifying a slash 128 for that specific case wouldn't work as expected. So what we did in this uh, document Next slide is to uh, actually discuss two cases or two, you know, two different topics when it comes to security operations. And these were the two main topics that, you know, came up as discussions with these groups, uh, which were the use of or uh, the enforcement of access control lists, whether they were a low list or block list, and, um, you know, that of network activity correlation. Essentially, same thing. Like if you are, for example, reviewing, you know, log entries in a CM platform, uh, you know, you have to be aware that, you know, even if there are like different, you know, IPv6 addresses, for example, in the case that they are all within the same slash 64, they could actually correspond like to the same node as opposed to, you know, different entities. So what we did is essentially provide context for these things. 
like you know how our addresses are you know configured and, and used in IPv6. Um, also, you know, uh, provide some hints about you know the address space that you know attackers normally control. You can assume that in virtually all cases they will control at least a slash 64. Quite usually, also uh, a slash 48. Whether that's because you know uh, you know the attacker gets a slash 64 from the attacker's ISP, or because you are using, for example, a free tunnel broken broker and you can essentially get like multiple slash uh, uh, 48s. So you could, you know, possibly be like uh, um, performing malicious or doing malicious activities uh, and be able to bury or change your address within that address block that you control. So essentially we provided, you know, background. Again, this uh, document is uh, targeted at operations people which are not necessarily you know, like IPv6 types, if you wish. So that's where, why the, you know, the, the background is like necessary. And then what we try to do is uh, provide some sort of advice to the extent that is possible, how you should uh, be doing a low list if you uh, want to do that, how you should be doing blog list if you want to do that, and what things you should keep in mind, you know, if you are doing network activity correlation. Now, we started with these two broad topics discussing providing background trying to provide um uh you know advice but then you know uh, while the document was being discussed you know in the opsec uh, working group mailing list on the meeting and in other mailing list there were other topics that were brought up uh next slide um okay and uh, next slide too yeah so these are the topics that were brought up um, I have my, you know, personal perspective on, on them, on whether to discuss them or not, but, you know, I thought that it was fair to actually bring them to the working group because at the end of the day, it's a working group item. Um, so these are topics that, you know, people brought up. Like one of them was uh, the topic of neighbor cash exhaustion. Uh, that is like well known at least within this group, okay? The idea is like super simple. You know, if you come from the IP before world, uh, you know that uh, every host will have like uh, some sort of you know table of data structure that will map IP addresses into MAC addresses, and in the IPv4 case is the ARP cache, in the IPv6 case is the neighbor cache. The thing is that in the IPv4 world, because of the size of you know the typical IPv4 subnets, there's like an artificial limit in the size of the ARP cache. You know, let's say if you are using a slash, you know, 124, well, you will have at least, at most, 256 entries and not more than that because that's a sub, the subnet size. But with IPv6, of course, if we are, you know, thinking about like the, you know, the default um, slash 64s, you know, at the end of the day, there's no artificial limit whatsoever. And, you know, a lot of uh, implementations, they don't actually enforce any kind of limit. So the thing is that in a number of scenarios, whether, you know, as, um, as an explicit intention of the attacker or as, a, or as a side effect, let's say that an attacker is doing a brute force address scan of a target network, you could end up in a situation where the neighbor cache, you know, grows so much until you get to some sort of, for example, denial of service uh, condition. Uh, this is a, a topic that, um, you know, there's, it is discussed in an RFC 6583, but there were folks that believed that we should at least, uh, you know, mention the topic because it's, it's directly related, you know, with um, IP, the, the, the security um, or operational implications of the, you know, IPv6 service space. Um, so if anything, I would probably just like mention the topic and include a pointer, ex you know, uh, except if there's if we have anything else to add other than what's already in 6483. Uh, next slide. Okay, the other topic that was brought up since we were like, uh, you know, briefly discussing, uh, you know, a low list and block list is to get deeper into firewalling. For example, there were folks suggesting that uh, we should discuss at least a little bit like bogan filtering. Um, there were folks that were suggesting that we should probably uh, discuss a little bit how you should probably do firewalling in typical deployment scenarios where you might have, for example, stable and privacy addresses. and. For example, in this case, you might want to, uh, you know, let's say allow 
uh, you know, any, um, uh, you know, uh, outgoing connection from any address, but you might want to only allow in go in incoming connections to the stable addresses where that are the addresses where you are in theory expected to receive um, these incoming uh, connections. Uh, some of these topics are discussed in a different document that uh, you know uh, we had published, uh, you know, at the time, and we have discussed a little bit within the um, B6 operations working group. Like some of the things, like what you might want to do when it comes to firewalling, when it comes in cases where you use stable and, for example, privacy or temporary addresses. But definitely, that's not something that is discussed in this document. Um, I'm open to whether you know whether we you know we want to include this or not. I mean, so far we haven't done that, but this is something that you know was uh, brought to us. So uh, uh, essentially, you know, we'd like to know what the working group thinks about this because it's a working group you know item. And uh, next slide. And yet the other topic that was brought up is to at least you know mention something if 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 it's not just you know providing a reference to you know how uh, people could possibly want to do uh, network reconnaissance for ipv6 networks essentially we all know that uh, you know in most cases you cannot simply do like a brute force address scan on an ipv6 network because the search space is simply too large so uh for example, if you are in a security team and you can do like a pen testing or some sort of audit for your own, you know, for your own infrastructure, uh, you will probably have to find like alternative techniques. There's a bunch of things that you could do, for example, from the point of view of the of a pen tester, like if you don't have like, you know, if, um, you know, if, if you're not being provided, like uh, explicitly being provided information about the target systems, you could do things such as, you know, pattern based IPv6 address scans, like, for example, in some cases, um, it, normally the case for, you know, infrastructure devices, uh, the addresses are selected from a small part of the address space. So there's that's one of the techniques that you could possibly leverage. Uh, you can possibly use DNS reverse mappings, obviously, if they are configured for you know the target systems. Um, obviously, if you are uh, auditing your own systems and, and as opposed to like an external pen tester or, or as an attacker, so to speak, uh, you could uh, essentially extract information from your IPAN platform. And there's a few other techniques. Most of them most of them, if not all, they have been discussed in detail in RFC 7707, uh, uh, but there's no mention about these things in, uh, you know, in, in this current document that, you know, uh, the OPSEC working group has uh, adopted. Uh, next slide. And next slide. So uh, we essentially like two things uh, or a few things. Well, obviously, number one and the obvious one is that uh, uh, we'd like, you know, additional reviews uh, to, let's say, improve the stuff that we already have in the document. Um, you know, we have tried to address the feedback that we have received so far. Obviously, there have been some things, particularly when, when it came to, you know, extending the scope of the document, so to speak, that, you know, we haven't, you know, uh, incorporated yet, but additional reviews are, you know, definitely welcome. And then the other thing is uh, two questions, essentially, you know, what to do about these three things, these uh, three topics that, you know, were, uh, were raised to us, whether we want to, let's say, just maybe include just a single paragraph and, you know, point to whatever document uh, that, uh, that has like further discussion on the topic or what. And the other, you know, the other one in, in the same line of, you know, these comments that we received, um, whether you think there are like uh, topics that are missing in the current document and you believe that uh, uh, those topics should be incorporated or should be covered in our document. Okay, I guess we open the line for questions and I have to abuse my power by putting myself on the queue. Uh, answering Fernand, your question about what to do with topic as a topics, I no hats on, right? I I just personally think that if particular topic extensively discussed in other document, it it should be sufficient just to put one line reference 
saying there are other issues or considerations which you can find in the followers list of the document, right? Because I think we there is no need to unnecessarily inflate the document and repeating something which has been said, right? Because if it's a stable, if it's RFC, then it's already been published and it's enough to put a reference. If it's draft, it will be much easier to keep all discussion in one place in that document instead of updating two. Uh, a few minor comments. I am a bit confused why the fact that a single publicly visible address might be actually represent multiple hosts or vice versa is specific to IPv6. It's actually absolutely the same for V4. We have not, and if I have a NAT pool, it might be exactly the same. So I honestly not sure why it is like V6 specific. It's nothing new here. It's just different form of NAT. So do you like to address it somehow in the document and saying it's, it's basically similar? Yeah, so there are two things. So on the, you know, on the uh, first comment that you made about like, you know, um, simply including pointers, like, you know, 100% in agreement, probably what we have been asked for the other topics is to try to provide ha some hints about, you know, what, why things are different. Like, for example, when, you know, when I was, uh, you know, providing an overview of the neighbor, neighbor cash exhaustion, uh, you know, issue, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it is of help. To practitioners, if you you know explain why the issue exists in you know in let's say IPv6 and maybe when it wasn't present in IPv4, in a lot of cases you know we assume that we already know that and that's probably the case. But in a lot of cases, these teams like maybe a DevOps team they don't really have a lot of experience with IPv6. So you know adding like a couple of lines saying well you didn't have this in IPv4 because of this and this is why you you might hit this in IPv6 that might be of use. Uh, but definitely, I don't think that we should, you know, cover again something that was covered in, a, you know, in another document. Just provide a reference. And regarding the second comment that you made about, like, uh, you know, uh, that of a single IPv6 address, uh, ident possibly identifying multiple systems, 100% in agreement that that. Okay, uh, one quick, actually two quick remaining comments. Uh, first of all, I think you might, you're saying that hosts may have multiple addresses and I think it's like, I would make it more like uh, clear that they usually have multiple addresses, right? Especially if you stop thinking about dual stack world and start thinking, thinking about a V6 only, where you have 464 x slot address, right? Which probably, makes all these DHCP v6 only scenario very complicated because host might want to have uh, check some neutral v6 address for 464x lot so you can if it's trying to request it from DHCP it, you cannot really predict what it's going to ask and here yeah I'm just shameless plug right do you want to mention that using prefix per host might actually drastically simplify your ECL configuration yeah, that's definitely something that, you know, should be incorporated in addition to the fact that, for example, in cloud environments, uh, um, you know, let's just mention one example because, you know, that's a specific example that we normally, you know, usually deal with. Like in GCP, normally, you know, HPM gets a slash uh, 96 by default. So that's kind of like, you know, it's like it's already happening one way or another, like, you know, some sort of prefix per host, even if it's not a slash 64, but the idea of uh, each host getting some, you know, prefix of whatever length, that's already like, um, you know, it's a reality already. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't have any question. Any more questions to the audience? Okay, so 
I'm not like I suggest people to read the draft and provide comments. And yeah, I, I, hopefully, yeah, we can get new revisions soon. With oh, Arno, are you in the queue? Ah. You're hiding behind the column. Yes. I can see you. Um, you got being hidden. Uh, hi, uh, Fernando. So, Arno Tadei, uh, Broadcom. So, uh, yeah, just uh, something I realized uh, when you spoke about pen test, and I'm not sure uh, if, if, it, if it's important to, uh, to represent that in the draft or not, but uh, in the EU at the moment, there is the big um, uh, DORA, D-O-R-A, uh, the Digital Operational, Operational Resiliency Act. Uh, and a lot has to do with the capability of the EU to uh, perform pen tests on uh, its FSI, uh, so its financial uh, institutions operating in, in Europe. But this goes very far. This goes to, uh, they consider any FSI to be part of an ecosystem of their providers. So there is a lot of things behind the scene, but uh, it's a lot about Tiber and pen tests and so on. And, and, uh, and well, I think if, if we are going this direction, you, you may want to perhaps look at that if this is uh, adding uh, water to your meal. Just my contribution. Hope it helps. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And if there are no more questions or comments, we'll thank you very much, Fernanda, for doing this. Uh, so, Tobias, I guess you're next. The floor is yours. Let's talk about revising BGP security. Uh, let me get the slides. Uh, uh, voice interface, okay. tell me next slide. So, uh, okay, um, so, Morning, everyone. I'm uh, Tobias, Max Planck Institute. This is more with the head of what is in the background, my private ASN thingy. Next slide, please. And it is about uh, BCP 194 or RFC 7454, um, which provides a lot of guidelines about how you should run BGP on the internet. It's from February 2015, so a time when RPKI was not yet a big thing, and uh, the internet kind of tends to change a bit. Next slide, please. So one of the examples that kind of struck my eye in the RFC is that um, it actually says IXPs should originate, for example, their peering LAN, and that IXP members should accept their IXP prefixes, um, well, if they are IR sound, and they should uh, actually announce them downstream. Um, if I think about like what the IXPs I'm currently at would do with me, next slide, please, um, it kind of looks more like that. So the uh, happiness of me starting to announce things to my downstreams, which involves a peering line, are kind of limited. Um, another example, next slide, please, would be uh, prefix filters. So quite recently, there was a little bit of fuss about the idea to deaggregate to slash 32 and turn it into the GRT, ideally via like a lot of various different upstreams or various different peering points to large upstream providers like HE, who peer basically everywhere with everyone. Um, this is not really accounted for in the recommendations on prefix filters. Um, there is sets for like less than GRT size for peers, more than GRT size for upstreams, uh, not that much for um, downstreams. And there should be something about global thresholds. There should be something about RPKI, at least in the form of, you know, should recommend, consider, maybe. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is um, this BCP as part. Um, the question is what one could do with that. I would say that for an errata, it's actually too many small things all over the document. Um, this might be a thing, or just going with a new draft and adding in like a lot more content. Um, what I'm certain of is that it would be good to update the document. And um, the question is why an OPSEC? Well, because OPSEC did BCP 194 in the first place. So I guess here's a place to start. And I just wanted to bring that up um, before I start writing anything. Thank you. I'm putting myself in the queue and I hope other people might have comments. So it does not look like a rata to me because it's not like we're fixing something which was incorrect in the document, right? The document was a, a result of consensus and it's just expectations and practices have changed. So it does look like a beast to me, actually. Yeah. 
like it says on the slides. Errata is kind of out of the picture. Yeah. So anyone wants to say anything? Help the bills to write it or oh, you see, getting volunteers. Thank you very much. Carlos Martinez. Okay, awesome. I will remember that. Cool. So uh, if anyone wants to say anything, then I hope for the next. Oh, yeah. So I'm getting the agenda for the next meeting, right? Uh, yeah. Beautiful. So I know I do have do need to request a session. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Rebius, for suggesting this. Okay, and the last presentation for today, let me get the slides. Pass validation and possible solutions. Yeah, just tell me to move the slides, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Chinchi. Uh, thank you, OFSEC, and uh, thank you, Jen, for giving us the uh, opportunity. Uh, so yeah, it's, um, today we wanna talk about path validation, a new solution that uh, we recently came up. So actually it comes from uh, a routing security, pro several routing security problems. And then we, uh, and then we come up with this uh, uh, method and uh, eventually we find uh, several, th this becomes a general technique that uh, could be applied to many different scenarios. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, the contents will be like the first word, what is path validation? How do we define it? And then like, why do we care about path validation? and what will be the use cases, and uh, then our solution based on the vector commitments. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as we said, like it comes from the um, problem of the routing security attacks. Uh, so like we used to have like routing hijack and routing injection and route leak. Um, then we start to think like, do we have like ways to secure the routing path? And then we have the BGP SEC and RPKI well, they're they're great. They're great works. Um, just a, a minor thing that we consider that, if, although like we have planned a secure routing path, uh, like in this way, like we have the desired path, but still, that's um, we kind of secure this in the control plane, and uh, this cannot guarantee that uh, the traffic is actually running in the data plane that actually takes this path like hop by hop. So uh, in this uh, in this way, that here the path validation is actually a mechanism to enforce and verify the correct transit of, tra of the traffic in the data plane. So also in the IETF, we see like Brockner's, uh, they brought up this idea in the, uh, uh, they, they target the same problem uh, in the SFC working group, uh, but regretfully discontinued. Um, uh, we kind of uh, follow that pattern and give another uh, technical solution. So in here, uh, like here, for example, like we have planned this uh, desired path and uh, the actual path that taking the uh, data plane could take a complete detour. And uh, in here is actually where we wanna uh, kind of raise some discussion to have more path awareness and path control uh, in general. So in here, the path validation is a, is a mechanism to make sure the path that we chose is the actual path that traffic travel, uh, travels on top of. Next slide, please. Yes, and here, what is path validation? It is a mechanism that ensures data packets to strictly travel on top of a chosen network path in the data plane. So what is a path? It is a, uh, a set of designated nodes in a specified order. So in different, uh, as we said, a general technique. In different scenarios, the nodes could be different. And the goals in here, are, actually we have two goals. Uh, that uh, explains the ensure, what does ensure mean? So number one is that we enforce the traffic to follow the path that we chose or we plan. And the number two is that after this tra travel is finished, we kind of uh, provide a transit proof that validates the traffic indeed traverses the path. So it's uh, like the two flips of a coin. So in order to achieve these two goals, we uh, kind of consider to add, we need like two auxiliary data to be added in the data packet. So one is the routing directive that actually steers the actual packet forwarding uh, for the first goal, and the next one will be a transit proof that securely logs like where did this packet um, traveled. So it's like a tra transit history. Next slide, please. So yeah, so consider um, this typical attacking scenario. So 
In here, Alice is having a confidential, uh, highly uh, sensitive, security sensitive communication. So it's like uh, maybe like a confidential business video meeting or a VIP call. So she wants like to make sure that her communication only goes to this uh, secure path to the end host. And she does not want any data of this communication to be detoured and monitored. So she wants the traffic never deviates from these uh, four secure routers. But in here, it's very possible as a, the, to hear the, in the router number three, the traffic could take a detour and uh, go to the malicious autonomous systems for dropping or monitoring or side channel attacks or just collectively criminalize to extract some kind of pattern um, to uh, as some uh, uh, attack results. And in here, this is like a very typical uh, traffic detour or a route injection attack. So that may be the use case. Uh, next slide, please. And also another use case in the service uh, function chaining, also is, uh, in these days of meeting, we kind of ran into some uh, uh, service provider people, in our service provider people, they kind of consider the same problem. Um, when the service provider hosted some network security service functions, and then, for example, like firewall, intrusion protect, uh, prevention and detection, traffic filtering, for example, and for a customer in here that purchased all these services, she, uh, this customer would like some kind of proof that the traffic that she's receiving actually was processed by these security functions. So it will be nice to hear for the traffic to carry some kind of process proof that actually this traffic has went through all these service functions. So the node in here, um, the abstract node in here is a service functions. And uh, next slide, please. Another use case is uh, the proof of uh, service level assurance connection. So say Alice has bought a premium in our plan from in a service provider. And uh, different, next slide please, uh, different routers may have uh, different service levels and she, we want to prove that Alice uh, is receiving her connection only on top of the premium uh, router nodes. Next slide please. So in here we kind of come up with this uh, new uh, vector commitment uh, a new primitive based uh, path validation solution. So here we actually using a primitive cop commitment uh, and uh, in crypt uh, cryptography like commitment is to, uh, a regular commitment is to, you commit to one value at first secretly and then you can reveal it later and then you can prove that the value you revealed and, and the value you committed are consistent to each other. And in here when we use the vector commitment is actually you can commit to a vector of these kind of values. And the values must be position binding. This value must be in the correct position and they can be selectively revealed uh, to compute a, uh, 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 opening proof and they can be uh, verified to each other. So in here, like we can see a, re a resemblance in here. Uh, for example, uh, in the, like we said, like commitment had three stages. We have to commit, we reveal, and then we verify. And in here we have a similar stages, for example, in here, when we are using it, uh, the stage one is the network controller would like to select a path. For example, in here, the router R1 to uh, R4, one, two, three, four, and uh, the router in here, if it follows our technique, it will select this path and compute a commitment, a cryptographic commitment. We can consider just is a constant length reference value. And then the number two, is that uh, when this traffic is actually uh, traveled, forwarded, and uh, when it passes every router, this router RI will forward the data and at the same time compute a transit proof. And uh, if this transit proof PI, uh, along with the reference value commitment, they can be verified against each other and uh, to, uh, to see that if it's the correct router is processing our uh, traffic in the correct position. So in here, as we said, like the security has the position binding security. So this is where the security comes from. The transit proof that the router computed uh, will only successfully pass a verification if and only if three conditions are met. So number one, this transit, this transit proof is computed by the right node, is computed by the right node as right position, and also it's, it's uh, consistent to what has been committed in the very first place. So three conditions must be all met. Uh, and this is the, where the security comes from. Uh, and also, 
uh, vector commitment is actually an abstract uh, class of techniques and it has very different constructions. And the construction we're using right now, uh, I apologize for like the, because of the submission deadline, we didn't actually add the solution to the draft, but we have the solution, we added to the zero one. Uh, the actual construction we're using is called KZG polynomial commitment. It's something that Ethereum is trying, uh, currently using. It has very nice properties. So an advantage is here is very efficient, it's succinct, and it's batch proof friendly. So efficient here means the proof, the transit proof that each uh, router is computing is always uh, constant time. The creation and verification is always all O1 time. That's very nice. And also number two is the succinctness. So the transit proof, uh, if we want to have like an in-situ, um, you know, uh, verification and pass through and then the transit proof size is very important. So in here, the transit proof is also a constant size. Um, in here, the, uh, and also in here, the batch proof friendly means that we can selectively like open one by one, uh, and we can also open all at once. So like, so like a batch verification, uh, sorry, batch proof creation friendly. So if there are actually three modes that we are trying to currently like design it. So the first is like a postcard, so every router is computing the transit proof. Uh, you know, when the traffic goes to R1234, when the R3, for example, is computing a route transit proof, it will be sent to the uh, network controller or some security sense, uh, center. Uh, this will act like a postcard. Sorry. And yeah, you know, right. And so in this way, like the routers will like pop up like from a uh, observer perspective that means like this green light popping up along this path and this continues. And there are like other modes that we use like passport or find only that's for efficiency. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna update that in a zero one draft. Next slide, please. So when we have this kind of uh, path validation mechanism, actually uh, back to the use case that we're talking about with Alice, traffic was detoured to some malicious autonomous systems or some malicious nodes, then because we have the position binding and security property, this malicious node number four, he cannot uh, compute a correct transit proof because he's not the right node, is not in the right position, and it's not definitely not consistent to what has been committed. So in here, the, uh, this, uh, this false fault transit proof will halt the connection and also alarming the owner or the user. Slide, please. So yeah, this is a work in progress. Uh, uh, we're also looking for collaborators to work together, also to extend. Uh, actually, we didn't. Although we didn't include it in the draft, we also made some implementation, uh, a, a very simple POC to test the time uh, and the proof size, uh, very basic things. And the measurement results. The transit proof actually takes uh, something like 48 bytes, and the proof verification and proof creation takes about one to two milliseconds on my MacBook. Uh, we're still trying to like uh, really develop on the core routers, and uh, because it's more computational capable, and uh, there will be a lot of optimization work uh, to do. So yeah. Okay. Questions, I see people in the queue. Hi, this is Gargi. So <clears throat> if you go back to your second last slide. Second uh, last, so, sorry. The, is this yeah, one? Yeah, this one. Uh, or the one that where you had the Alice diagram where oh. the transit proof is uh, shown. Is this one? Yes, this one. So uh, one question. So if you're saying that the transit proof is the packet will go to the malicious router mm -hmm. or the router in the malicious AS and then the transit proof is validated. One thing is that that router may not be forward compatible, right? It may be something that doesn't support this. And it's too late if you have let the, pack, the packet go into a malicious AS, right? So it should be, my feedback would be, it should be enforced on the exit router, which is the non-malicious uh, AS router, the edge router. Uh, and the second question is like, how much is the, because this would have to be implemented in the forwarding plane, yes. right? So how much is the extra memory cost, the compute cost? Have you thought about that? 
Greg. Uh, so let me start with the second question. So uh, just like we said, I, on an old MacBook uh, and the actual extra computational overhead of computing one transit proof is uh, one millisecond. And actually it's more efficient than what we have compared uh, for the existing solutions in the academia, um, so the icing and the uh, OSV for some people may, you may know. Uh, they, all, they all take several tens or hundreds of milliseconds. And in here, we are all cryptographic and, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, my, uh, yeah. Uh, so for a pure cryptographic solution, uh, also it takes a theoretically constant time and uh, I think uh, could be optimized. Um, yes, and the first question was, uh, yeah, whether like why let it exit the non-malicious AS? Because if you exit into the malicious AS, it's too late. You cannot enforce it anymore. Right. So that means we need some kind of routing directive uh, to make sure that it doesn't go that way at the first time. So like if it, we do things like this currently, uh, it's a work in progress, definitely. But in here, if uh, this routing, uh, if the traffic goes to this router, and it will be like passively intercepted because it's not going anywhere. And in the actual solution that we're using, we're also combining the use of a routing, uh, like the Onion router, uh, so to speak, uh, such that every hop will only know like what this next hop is going to. So yeah, we can take this discussion to the list, but that would be my feedback to not let it exit the non-malicious AS and enforce it at that point. Jeff, as I've had more time to think about this since your first version of the presentation. Um, so quick comment on the timing, tens of milliseconds in forwarding. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> too, too slow. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's terrible. Um, the, the, I'm going to take Gargi's observation a slightly different direction. I suspect that there's people behind me for the same reason. Um, you're assuming at node three in your example here <clears throat> that this is a node that actually is uh, happily participating in the system and is intending to do its job. The system you're describing can verify uh, that the green boxes have touched things. That's basically what uh, you're trying to assert here. What you can't do, and makes me question the value of at least what the original value proposition is for, you can't tell that traffic has been diverted. And you know, as an example, you know, if it's only three that's being a, you know, a cooperating party in the subversion, the traffic may go three, four, five, back to three to you know, there, so the man in the middle. And any flavor of tunneling technologies will allow this to be subverted, especially if it, uh, as we say, hairpins back to the original case. And if three and four are participating uh, in the hijack themselves, then you still can't tell that. You, you will still have generated the correct signature as it passes through devices that are sort of violating your use case of not allowing them to be inspected. So yeah, to answer your question, actually we have two ways of solving this. Uh, number one is the original validation. So each <coughs> router, when it actually receives a packet, it also uh, like verifies the previous transit proof and also where it comes from. Yeah, uh, that's that's the step, that's the solution number one, and uh, the other one that we're using might be we might uh, also adapt uh, adopt sorry uh, is a secure cryptographic accumulator that uh, actually uh, records like how many hops it actually went through. So if you treat four and five as this transparent pipe that's not participating in you know this new system, you can't stop somebody from looking through the transparent pipe as the stuff's going by. So if your goal is to provide secrecy by hiding the traffic, you have to make sure that you can't intercept it. And that is just simply not possible in multiple contexts. You know, the two easy examples for you to take a look at and that are shipping things today. Uh, the United States flavor of this is called Kalia, you know, where you're having law enforcement flipping a bit that allows them to just simply get copies of all your packets. It wouldn't change the forwarding. They get to see everything they want. You can't stop them. Second flavor of this is I work on a dynamic signaling mechanism called FlowSpec, which allows for interception of this type of stuff, often for purposes of silently trapping the traffic and maybe selectively allowing it back on. You can't stop the subversion of the path. I see Warren saying that. <laughs> um, 
and that's fine. What I suggest is, uh, you know, it's not your core use case. You're still having a mechanism that says each of these routers have touched things. Perhaps there are good use cases for that. But if your core use case is that you can't subvert it, I do not believe you actually have a viable solution here. Mm, right. So actually, the, the existence of path through or transparent nodes or tunnels is actually is kind of contradictory in the logic. So by definition, like path through nodes or tunnels are actually not perceivable. So by definition, it's not perceivable. So exactly. How, how, how it's, it's actually a little bit out of scope. I will say, at least you must have some kind of way to, you know, log the, you know, at least the index that is currently uh, how many hops it went through. So it, it is possible that, you know, when the malicious nodes kind of just uh, alter the like TTL or some kind of index, it's very possible. Uh, but, you know, as we said, like this is a work in progress. Yeah, and it's the case that uh, some people attempt to look for such traffic diversion using things like changes to the jitter, the latency, other things that basically if the speed of light is telling you that something else is happening, that's sometimes a hint, but it's, you know, as Warren's making a good face about, it's not always a good hint about it. The only, tech, the only sort of technological space that we currently have that avoids complete subversion isn't this type of signature. It's you actually have a quantum bit stream you know, proceeding from one to four. And you know, if you're interfering with the bit stream, you'll collapse the waveform and it'll stop validating. So we, that's, that's a little bit on the science fiction end of things for full you know, packet rates at this point. <laughs> right. So I think you, you have made a very great point. And also, it's, uh, as you said, the, it's a work in progress. It's something that you know, it, it is open challenge. And uh, we want to like, at least give some solution that we can iterate on. Again, like I said, you've proven you can touch the routers. Decide where that's valuable. Cool. Jeff Houston, um, I'm having a hard time with this. And, and in some ways, you know, I can't match this to the internet that I'm on. Stateless hop-by-hop -hop destination based forwarding over equipment that I have no control of plays no role in this. And, and what you really need is strict source-based routing with constrained behaviors on all the elements that touch the packets and constrained behaviors on all the transmission systems that pass those packets, because you're trying to get proofs and validation all the way through. You could build those things. The telephone network did a great job and probably you know, bits of it are still working in circuit switching and good on them, but it's not this internet. And it's kind of, is what you're proposing here some kind of way that you can stuff this into routers you have no control of, and I don't think that's possible, or are you saying, I can build the telephone network again? And the answer is, well, yay, yeah, you can, and it's not a problem, but you've got to control every last element. You're trying to constrain the behavior of every last switching system, and you're trying to actually constrain and ensure the integrity of every transmission element. Now, you can build it, that's fine, but it's not the internet the rest of us are on. And it's kind of, what's the point in a more generalized context? This does not improve the security of BGP. It does not improve the security of using the public internet. This kind of solution has no application in that venue. And now you're posing a set of proofs amongst cooperating entities, closed constraint, different universe, and saying, can I build that? And the answer is, yeah, sure. The maths can work. All this can work. Is it useful for the rest of us? I'm not getting there going. I just can't make that particular thing work. It just doesn't work in a more generalized context. And so I'm trying to understand, and maybe I've almost given myself up at this point in trying to understand why this has application beyond that strictly private world that needs that level of assurance. So, yeah, from my understanding, some application like want to be path aware or at least some kind of uh, control uh, over the, <laughs> the application has no say here you're deep down in the infrastructure all the way through applications can wish for the moon if they want it ain't going to happen <laughs> applications might like the rocket ship to pluto painted purple with green spots it's not going to happen you know applications have no say in this kind of infrastructure 
uh, yeah, could you like limit the use of analogy and uh, what, what Well, I'm saying that the hyperbole is, is kind of saying it's not an application decision. It's, it's, it's down at the infrastructure level is what you're trying to build here. And, and applications can work on that, great, but they can't dictate to the rest of the network the way the, you know, the infrastructure should behave. Yes. There is no power. Right, I, I, I totally support that. Uh, it's just uh, like, might be a different paradigm, I will say. Like for example, like uh, before, like uh, we, we could have like auto, like where application layer, like we kind of optimize which path you're gonna take. Or sorry, I'm, that might not be purely accurate. Um, but what I'm trying to say, like, uh, I think it's, I think it's a, just a different solution that might, you know, fit in some scenarios. Okay, uh, let me may I quickly interrupt here. For the lack of time, I suggest yeah you can talk to Jeff offline. I just quickly hijack the queue here with my PNRG chair hats on. You might want to bring some of it to next PNRG meeting and see what PNRG people would say. PNRG, Passover Network and Research Group. Because what you're doing here is more like in research area, really. And yeah, and there are, and I suspect some of this might be of interest, right? I am not, I'm not making any like, comments about content, but I think it's kind of might be of interest for the area. Like there is some overlap between, you actually quoting like uh, uh, open questions for Passover networking in your draft. So you're already kind of referring to this. So maybe you might want to consider that. So we're gonna meet in Prague, so you might yeah, get a like lightning talk there. And uh, sorry for interrupting, uh, Tobias. Um, hello, Tobias Fivik. Um speaking for myself and explicitly not my affiliation. And I'm, I'm trying to also wrap my head around um, the use this could have and in which uh, context it could be useful. Did, did, didn't you have a slide with like all three use cases you thought of? Could you maybe bring that up? Uh, okay, I think they came one after another. Uh, okay, yeah. let, let's, let's start with the first one, which was uh, security. So when I, when I think about the security implication of that, as previous speakers said, it would kind of be security by obscurity, because you would do that if you could not ensure the security of the packets flowing there. But when I think about a case where I would need that, it would be, for example, like the US government used to do, no, wait, wait I think it was a European subgrant of that. If you have like a, a national crypto, which is weakened, and you have all ASs within your jurisdiction collaborating with this, you can ensure that your weakened crypto packets do not leave your jurisdiction. And within your jurisdiction, you want, of course, to have weaker crypto because, well, lawful interception and all that stuff. Doesn't work, usually leaks, but policymakers usually have ideas. Um, the next case, please. Yes. Um, so, so this very specific case, um, th there it seems to be more like a technical solution to the social problem of vendors or suppliers tending to like to take shortcuts of, um, well, not providing the service you booked. So uh, similar as with the SLA case, which I think was the next one, um, there it tries to address the underlying issue of you pay for a service and the entity you're paying doesn't deliver. But that is an inherently social problem. Right? If you cannot trust your vendor, well, you have an issue, but on another layer. Solving that on layer three, I think is somewhat difficult. So I, I, I think like all ways I could think of how that would have a purpose, don't feel overly good. And maybe you can like poke me into that direction to understand where there are like better use cases. Um, uh we have one minute left. We have two people in the queue. So if I then might we suggest we can, yeah, we continue this discussion offline. So Q. Uh, Q Marcel, two hopefully very quick questions. Uh, you Have you tested how much throughput you can get through this? As in not how quickly you can sign it, but how much actual data you can shove down something signing this. And secondly, can you implement <laughs> it in ASIC? Uh, 
equivalent in in an ASIC. Application specific okay. integrated circuit. Can you implement it in a chip? Uh, right. So first, uh, so the second question is that we are trying to work on that. Uh, okay. Also with the hardware people, I think this could be like enhanced uh, with the help of hardware or trusted hardware in some way. And then the first question the, about the throughput, no. So we kind of uh, uh, didn't do this. We all just uh, like for one time uh, test uh, on the efficiency. Okay. Okay, Rudiger, please. Very short corner. Yes, kind of. I'm not aware of that many business cases where users of network services would like to have no fallback routing, making sure that the packets that they deliver actually gets to the end, the desired one. Uh, yes, of course, sometimes even that doesn't work. But this would really preclude dealing with failures in the network. And wasn't there this saying that the internet is rooting around failures? Okay, thank you. I, uh, yeah, we, Warren, yeah, we, I, I guess, yeah, we can discuss it in the lobby, not delaying whoever, whatever working group will be in this room. Thank you very much. As I say, yeah, we might talk about pay energy, a part of it, potentially, and it, it wasn't, please look in the chat. There is some reference to what science people doing together with pay energy. You might find that interesting. Thank you very much, everyone. Think about the agenda item for Prague. Thanks. It's kind of my first time here, so. I think we should have logs for chats, yeah. no? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 that's okay. No, you're not expected to. No, 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 that's fine. I think we have logs for the chat room. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.